So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, taking a, a glaucoma history, but particularly looking at risk factors and epidemiology of glaucoma. And the reason I thought this was important is that I read, I was reading an old textbook and I read this sentence that most ophthalmologists on planet Earth are confused regarding the diagnosis and management of glaucoma, which I thought was quite amusing. And also it went on to say that history taking is the most neglected part of glaucoma management. But we can see why that might be the case, because most cases of glaucoma are asymptomatic. A pressure over 21 is not synonymous with glaucoma. There's an inability to um, appreciate the pitfalls in pressure measurement. And there's an inability to appreciate other diseases that might mimic glaucoma. Well, where do we find our patients from? Well, as you know, uh, most glaucoma uh, patients are referred from optometrists, from the GP, or from screening because of a family history of glaucoma. And many of these patients are asymptomatic. It, it can be symptomatic from vision loss. Um, it can be symptomatic from episodes of intermittent or angle closure, and patients can present with pain with very high intraocular pressures. But what's, what's more important really in the history is looking for risk factors to decide what are the likelihood of a patient sitting in front of you, what risk factors they have for developing glaucoma. So these are some of the risk factors. So there's strong evidence, very strong evidence, that older age, increases the risk of glaucoma, as does uh, ethnic origin, elevated intraocular pressures, and changes in the optic nerve. There's moderate evidence that a family history of glaucoma increases the risk, but fairly modest evidence that a history of diabetes or hypertension is a risk factor for glaucoma. I'm just going to look at, look at some of the evidence in large epidemiological studies about some of these risk factors and what are the risk factors in certain groups of them developing glaucoma. These are large, um, quite old now epidemiological studies looking at the influence of age and race on a, as a risk factor for glaucoma. So you can see in, in one study, um, in the group of patients, in the group of, um, in this uh, group of people, aged between 40 and 49 years old, the prevalence of glaucoma is of just over 1%. But if you look at in this group of patients over the age of 80, and these are African-American patients, the prevalence of glaucoma is over 10%. And there are other epidemiological studies showing that age is an important factor. Uh, in this group in patients, un in, sorry, in the group of people under the age of 75, the prevalence is 3.4%, but in people over the age of 75, again, it approaches 10%. And you can see in a black population, the difference is even more startling. In the group over 75, the prevalence was over 20%. Now, we, all, we always ask about family history um, when we're asking about patients with glaucoma, but we, don't, and we do know that family history increases the risk of glaucoma. We also know that the inheritance of glaucoma is not, is, sorry, the inheritance of glaucoma is multifactorial and it's a polygenic disease. And you can see that, again, from some of these epidemiological studies, the lifetime risk of glaucoma in somebody 80 years um, of age is 10 times higher if there is a positive family history. This is from an old epi epidemiological study as well, looking at family history. And this shows the odds ratio of a family member having glaucoma. So for instance, if there's primary open angle glaucoma in a parent, the odds ratio is just is about 1.3. That's 1.3 times higher than if you didn't have a parent with glaucoma. If, there's, if you have primary open angle glaucoma in a sibling, then the risk of glaucoma is three times greater. And the odds ratio in a, uh, if you have a first degree relative, is, a, is almost two, two times. Diabetes is, is thought by many patients to be a risk factor for glaucoma. 
but the evidence is quite modest. So you can see in one epidemiological study, the risk of glaucoma was about twice that in diabetics than it was in non-diabetics. But interestingly, there was a large study, you'll be aware of the ocular hypertension treatment study, which showed that diabetes was protective. This actually was probably because of the case selection and the patients with diabetes, many were excluded from the study. Hypertension is a moderate risk factor for glaucoma. And again, if we look at some of the epidemiological studies, um, uh, in the Blue Mountains High study, glaucoma was much more common in patients with systemic hypertension than in patients without high elevated blood pressure. And then another couple of studies showing that individuals with a systolic blood pressure over 130 millimeters of mercury had a higher prevalence of primary open angle glaucoma. As part of our other, hip, other parts of our history taking, we look at these other factors which um, you're very familiar with. And we'll look at some of these in relation to patients with glaucoma. So let's look at um, refractive error. So we do know that myopia has an increased frequency amongst patients with both ocular hypertension and primary open angle glaucoma. Uh, in one study, about 60% of patients progressing from ocular hypertension to primary open angle glaucoma were myopic. And this is a, an epidemiological study from China showing that subjects with more than six diopters of myopia were significant, had a significantly higher frequency of developing glaucoma than lower degrees of myopia or patients who are emotropic. Also, it's important to look in the past ocular history at other factors. For instance, if the patients had previous surgery, patients having vitreoretinal surgery, for instance, uh, are more at risk of developing glaucoma. And it's important to look at other factors. Is it the patient's only eye? Have they had previous laser refractive surgery? Are they pseudophagic or phagic or aphagic? And it's also important in children to look for amblyopia and anisometropia because these are often associated with asymmetric optic disc appearance. There are several factors in the past medical history that we need to take account of. So for instance, patients with asthma. So this might um, preclude us having to use beta blockers, for instance, which can exacerbate the, the uh, chest problem. If there's a past history of rheumatoid arthritis, it may, might, may make patients have difficulty in instilling the eye drops. Heart block might stop us using certain types of drops like beta blockers. A history of migraine or Raynaud's might increase the risk of normal tension glaucoma. And there's many papers on asthma looking at the respiratory side effect of topical beta blockers, uh, dating back really to the 1970s and 80s when beta blockers were first used. It's also important to know which drugs, other drugs the patients are taking because some of these drugs might interact or interfere with our glaucoma treatment. So for example, patients on uh, anticoagulant drops that might interfere with our glaucoma surgery. Patients on uh, systemic beta blockers that might influence the choice of our topical treatment because there, there may be no point in using a topical beta blocker if a patient is already, already taking a systemic beta blocker. And it's also important to know if there's a past history or continued use of steroids because that might affect or have caused the elevated intraocular pressure. And also there may be interactions with our classes of drugs that we use for glaucoma. So let's just look at some of the interactions. So for beta blockers, um, drugs that elicit bradycardia or a cardiac arrhythmia uh, can interfere with the effectiveness of the topical beta blocker. And these are three examples. So an example of a cardiac glycoside is digoxin. An example of a sodium channel blocker, quinidine, procainamide, lidocaine. And an example of calcium channel blockers uh, barapamil and diltiazem. So these can interact with our topical beta blockers. And also remember that beta blockers can mask the hypoglycemia in diabetics. Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, so dorzolamide and brinzolamide, 
they can be interactions with numerous drugs. So it's important to take a full drug history. Be aware that uh, prostaglandins, we try and avoid them in early pregnancy. And I think the most important interaction to remember is alpha-2 agonists, such as bromonidine. So bromonidine uh, can cross the blood-brain barrier, and in very small children, can have severe systemic side effects. So when you're treating children with glaucoma, always avoid bromonidine in children under the age of about six years. Aproclonidine, or iopidine, is an alpha-2 agonist as well, but it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it's much safer to use in children than bromonidine. So aproclonidine, the other name is iopidine, the same drug, um, is safer to use in children. This was meant for our, um, our residents, but it's very important because um, when we're doing medical records, it's important that our records are dated, we have diagnoses and drops written, it's signed, and, and, a point and appropriate follow-up is taken afterwards. But um, ignore that. It was, it was meant for my re residence. So thank you. That's a quick history taking.